Where did we humans get the idea that there are other worlds than this one? When did we first think that there might be an afterlife? Or a spiritual realm that's not material? When did we start believing in either lots of gods, what's known as polytheism, or just one god, what's known as monotheism, and divine beings who reside somewhere beyond us, either on Mount Olympus or in a transcendent heavenly paradise? I've always been fascinated by these questions. And I should say at the outset, this session is about religion, but we'll be speaking from the position of objective historians about numerous religions. I realize that many of us hold certain beliefs or faiths, which may make it difficult to remain completely objective, if that's even possible. I say this to emphasize that our secular historical approach in this session should in no way be taken as a challenge to anyone's beliefs or spiritual commitments. I was raised Catholic, which means the Christian narrative and belief system is most familiar to me. Because of this, unconscious biases almost certainly inform the way I approach the question of religion. Even so, I'm always trying to learn more about other faiths. And this is what the following session tries to do by looking at many different objects and being open to multiple perspectives and different world traditions. So back to my original question, where does the human religious impulse come from? We've already looked at prehistoric cave paintings and speculated on rituals that had to do with animals. What if early humans looked around and saw all these amazing beings, some friendly and some dangerous, and then projected divine characteristics onto them? Remember, while we have scientific knowledge about what it means to be a living animal, a prehistoric human would have no way of explaining these creatures around him or her. They would not even, ha they would not even have had the concept of animal yet, or even human. Another hypothesis. Maybe the idea of a world from beyond this one came from certain natural elements, fire or lightning or celestial bodies like the moon and the sun. We know today that lightning is electricity and that the sun is a gaseous nuclear reactor made largely of hydrogen converting into helium, but this is relatively new knowledge in human history. What if early humans understood these elemental phenomena as appearing and disappearing as coming from another realm, as divine visitors to their daily lives. Maybe this is where spiritual ideas came from, from the experience of awe and wonder at the non-human world. Or what if the religious impulse came from mystical experiences induced by mind-altering or psychotropic substances, like certain plants or fungi? Evolu evolutionary biologists go even further back in explaining the human evolution of religious experience. They argue it arose from shared experiences of community living and the feeling, emotions, and rituals generated by social environments that gave early humans adaptive benefits. In other words, when we develop the ability to feel affection and empathize with one another, which in fact can also be found in many non-human animals like elephants, orcas, and crows that mourn for their dead, which leads to a fascinating side question. Do some non-human animals have some form of spiritual life, as the primatologist Jane Goodall has suggested about chimpanzees? Evolutionary biologists therefore argue that religious feelings were generated by interpersonal emotions. I don't know if this fully explains the origins of thinking about other worlds, though maybe loving another person means hoping that we'll see them again after they pass away, which could explain the origins of the idea of an afterlife. But it does lead us to one of the characteristics, one of the fundamental characteristics of spiritual and religious experience, ethics and morality. All the major world religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, Taoism, ancestral worship, and so on, teach their followers how to live a virtuous life and what it means to treat others with respect in some way, shape, or form. This is the basis for ethics and morality. This is very important to note because all the objects we look at during this session on the divine can be interpreted as communicated some, something about ethics and morality. There's one more thing I want to bring up before getting to our examples. When talking about art, objects, and the divine, it seems to me that there's a fundamental paradox. How can a material object, like a sculpture or a painting or even a book, represent a divine idea or presence? 
Another way of asking this is, how can material objects become mediums for immaterial entities? This is one of our fundamental questions for today, and we'll see different cultures and different religions handling this paradox in various ways. It's not really a paradox for most polytheistic religions, like Greek and Roman mythology, whose gods take on mortal form in all sorts of ways, or animist traditions that consider the natural world to be itself sacred and filled with spirits. But what about the monotheistic re religions, where the divinity never appears in material form? Like Judaism. Christians believe that their God became incarnate in the figure of Jesus of Nazareth, but still Christian theologians debated whether or not he can be represented and under what conditions. What I'm pointing out here uh, leads us to two key terms that I'd, like you to, that I'd like you to learn for today's session. The first is aniconism. Aniconism is the idea that certain holy figures cannot or should not be represented. The second term results from this first, iconoclasm. Iconoclasm is the act of destroying images or other forms of representation that are considered forbidden. A famous example is the golden calf story in Genesis from the Old Testament that Moses destroys as a false idol. The history of both Western and non-Western art is filled with debates and moments of aniconism and iconoclasm. Lastly, there are two other terms I'd like you to learn before we turn to our objects. One is prefiguration. Prefiguration is the idea that something in an older story foreshadows something in a newer story. The classic example is the relationship between the Old and New Testaments. The Old Testament is a Jewish text, which was later adopted by Christians. Prefiguration happens when Christian theologians interpret stories or ideas in the Old Testament as foreshadowing stories or ideas in the New Testament. A good example, when Abraham is told to sacrifice his son Isaac on Mount Moriah by the Old Testament God, this has been interpreted as foreshadowing the central event of Christianity, namely the sacrifice of the son of the New Testament God in the crucifixion. There are many more examples of, of prefiguration between Old Testament and the New, as well as in other religious traditions. Another important term I'd like you to know about is syncretism. Syncretism is when similar is when one culture or tradition takes on an influence from a previous culture or tradition, especially certain stories and visual styles, and then calls them their own. Think of it like sampling in music, when a newer song uses parts of older songs to make something new with them, and often people only know the newer song and not the source material. Nearly every religion is syncretic in some way. For example, Christianity is syncretic with Mithraism, a Persian religion whose god was born on December 25th. That this is now also Christmas is not a coincidence. It's also syncretic with Greek and Roman mythology. Here you're seeing a wine harvest that would have been associated with Dionysus and Bacchus for Greeks and Romans. But Christians took over uh, this event to symbolize the Eucharist. That is, the sacrament where wine turns into the blood of Jesus. Usually syncretism means that there's already a popular idea out there in people's imaginations and beliefs, which makes them attractive for appropriation and co-opting. Okay, let's look at some works of art having to do with the divine. This amazing painting on papyrus shows us a key sequence from Egyptian mythology. This is from the Book of the Dead, which documented a series of spells and rituals that help people safely navigate the underworld and hopefully enter the divine afterlife. The aim was to become a being of pure light who could live with the gods, but this was a perilous metamorphosis. One had to be tested and judged first. And that's what you're seeing on this papyrus. The Book of the Dead was created for a royal scribe named Hunifer, who died around 1275 before the Common Era. You can, see his you can see him multiple times dressed in white, being led by multiple figures in different scenes. At the very top left, his good deeds in life are being judged by a row of different gods. Below that, on the left, he's being led by the jackal-headed god Anubis, who watches over the dead and the mummified. In the next scene, also with Anubis, you can see the god weighing Hunifer's heart against a feather, 
it was thought that the heart was the seat of intelligence and feeling. Another god, the ibis-headed Toth, credit, credited with inventing writing, is recording the results of the weigh-in. If the heart is heavier than the feather, it means the deceased person has sinned too much and can't make it to the afterlife. If that happens, the person's heart is given to Amit, who, who, uh, to devour, who appears next to Anubis by the scales, and is a crocodile-hippo-lion hybrid. In this case, Hunifer's heart passes the test, and in the final sequence with the god Horus, who has a falcon's head, leads him to Osiris, the ruler of the afterworld. Behind him are his sisters Isis and Nephthys. On a lotus flower just in front of Osiris are his four sons, who each protect one of Hunifer's vital organs. With this amphora, an ancient pottery with a large oval body and two handles, we move forward to archaic Greek art. It's an example of black figure painting on pottery. Painted ancient pottery also comes in red and white figure painting. Here we have two important heroes from Greek mythology. On the left, on the left is Achilles, the most powerful warrior from Homer's Iliad, which tells the story of the Trojan War. He was the son of a sea nymph named Thetis, and his father was King Peleus. So Achilles is half man and half god. He has, on his, he has his helmet on his head and holds two spears with his shield propped up just behind him. Opposite him is Ajax, who is also in the Iliad and an important Greek, Greek mythological hero. Heroes in ancient Greece met human beings who had divine roots. Achilles and Ajax are in fact cousins. His helmet is resting behind him on top of his shield, and he also holds two spears. The two warriors are leaning forward, concentrating on the game they're playing against each other. Formally, there's an incredible symmetry to this image, not only in the way the design curves and fits naturally with the physical shape of the amphora, but also in the visual call and response between Achilles and his things and Ajax and his, and his things. Everything is framed so that your eye leads to the tips of their finger, fingers and their points of concentration on the game. The Greeks loved their myths, which were often bloody and tragic. These two warriors were no different. Achilles gets killed in battle, even though his mother Thetis had dipped him in the river Styx so he would become immortal. She just forgot to coat the part of the heel she was holding, which is why today when we say, that's my Achilles heel, we're saying we have one weakness or shortcoming. For his turn, Ajax would lose a context against Odysseus, Odysseus being the central character in Homer's other great work, The Odyssey, and then kills a number of fellow Greeks in blind rage, which ultimately, ultimately leads him to commit suicide on his own sword. His demise is also grim. Many temples were built in the honor of gods, goddesses, and heroes. Sacrifices and ceremonies would, he, would be held in these temples, and later in the semester, we're going to study the most famous Greek temple, which was dedicated to the goddess Athena. The myths were also the state religions, politics and myth being intertwined. Reading all the wonder wonderful myths from this period, with their many centuries of distance, it's tempting to ask, did the Greeks really believe in their myths? Did they really think there was a Zeus on Mount Olympus, Poseidon in the ocean, and Hades in the other world? Did they really believe that the gods could take on various human and animal forms, intervening in their lives? This is a fascinating question that various scholars has posed, and it's interesting to think about. After the Greeks came, the Romans, after the, after the Greeks came the Romans, who first had a republic and then an empire. While the Romans would conquer the Greek peninsula from their Italian peninsula, along with much of the rest of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean world, when it came to religion, they didn't start from scratch. The Roman gods are basically the Greek gods by different names. So Zeus becomes Jupiter, Poseidon becomes Neptune, Aphrodite becomes Venus, and so on. This is a clear example of syncretism, of one culture taking on and appropriating a previous culture's traditions. There are other differences. The Greeks would usually only dedicate their temples to one god. The Romans, on the other hand, would devote temples to multiple gods. And in the case of our next example, to all the gods. This is one of the most incredible buildings in Rome, the Pantheon. Pan means every, and Theos means God, so it was a temple to all the gods. It's an architectural marvel, and the Romans made some serious advances in building, 
notably the invention of concrete, without which the Pantheon would not have been built. It was finished during the Emperor Hadrian's rule, who had said may have had a role in its construction. You're seeing it from the front entrance and the portico of 16 divine Corinthian columns. These type of columns, which have vegetable decorations at their top, were first used by the Greeks, but the Romans used them far more extensively. From this plaza, it looks like the front of a Greek temple. And check out the scale of people walking around it outside. It's a monumental structure. If I show you the building schematic, you notice right away something spectacular about the Pantheon. While the front makes it seem as if you're about to enter a long rectangular space, you actually come into a large spherical space, and the sphere is a perfect circle of 142 feet in diameter. The Pantheon may also have been associated with the, divinity, uh, with the divine authority of the emperors. Again, there was no separation between religion and politics. Emperors would even become gods after they died. The building itself even seems to represent the cosmos. In Greco-Roman cosmology, the universe was an orb with Rome at the center. Today we know that the universe is expanding and that time and space are relative. But back then, when philosophers looked up at the night sky, they thought they were seeing a round canopy with stars fixed to it. This was called the firmament. They then thought that the sun, moon, and the planets that they could see moved along concentric circles around the earth. This was the universe to ancient Greeks and Romans. So notice how this model of the cosmos fits perfectly in the spherical shape of the Pantheon. And this was no accident. The symbolism here is one of Roman power and importance. In other words, control over the cosmos, control over everything. And indeed, at this time, the Roman Empire was super expansive. When we step inside, we can see that the firmament and the celestial bodies were represented in the Pantheon. Those square shapes that you're seeing on the ceiling are called coffers, and originally they would have had precious stones of different colors that would have radiated like stars in the sky. Really though, the first thing you notice is that large oculus at the center of the dome. It's 27 feet in diameter, and it's completely open to the elements, rain or shine. The Romans developed a drainage system when rain came in, that still works today. Of course, this oculus also stands in for the sun, and indeed when the sun shines through, there's a beam of light that travels throughout the space. One can even use this building like a sundial, deciphering the time of day and the season according to the sun's rays. And in a polytheistic religion like Greco-Roman mythology, all these elements and celestial bodies would have, be, would have been associated with certain gods, Sol being the sun god and there would have been statues of gods inside, inside the Pantheon during the Roman Empire. In 609, the Pantheon was converted into what it is today, a Roman Catholic Church, which means, which means any explicit reference to Roman mythology, what for the Catholic Church was pagan, was removed. Here we have again religious syncretism at work. Some 200 years later, Rome was under the rule of Emperor Constantine. It's with this emperor that something happens which will be immensely consequential for the history of world religion. Here you're seeing the colossal statue of Constantine. It's in pieces now, and we only have the head and some limbs. But still, the head is eight and a half feet high, which is big by itself. And this means that the original statue would have been over 30 feet high. Constantine took over the Roman Empire when it was divided between four and then two emperors. There was a power struggle between these emperors, which Constantine will eventually win. There was an especially consequential battle between him and a rival emperor named Maxentius in 312. Before going into battle, it was said that Constantine saw a flaming cross in the sky. After having this dream or vision, he told all his soldiers to emblazon this symbol on their shields, as he thought it was a sign from the Christian god. When Constantine's army was victorious, he gave credit not to any Roman god, but the Christian god. This proved incredibly consequential. Just a year later, Constantine would announce the Edict of Milan, which made it illegal to persecute Christians, who had been severely persecuted before then. This would eventually lead to the Edict of Thessalonica in 380, which proclaimed Christianity as the official state religion of Rome. The Roman Empire was over. Now it became a Roman Catholic Empire. 
and its capital moved east to, Byzant to Byzantium, which is modern-day Istanbul in Turkey, but which Constantine named after himself, Constantinople. This was the center of the Byzantine Empire, the eastern part of the Roman Catholic Empire. The success story of a once persecuted religion become the, becoming the official state religion of the Roman Empire is really incredible, and all because of one man's vision. This history, which is part of the history of the three major monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, can also be a, can also be a bit confusing. So let me show you a general timeline to make things clear. The oldest is Judaism, which starts around 1000 before the Common Era in modern-day Israel-Palestine. Then, around the turn of the first millennium, a small group of Jewish dissidents challenged not only the established Jewish priests and their temple in Jerusalem, but also the Roman Empire itself, which occupied these lands. The Roman Empire tolerated under other religions as long as they remained subservient to Roman gods and rule. These Jewish dissidents were Jesus of Nazareth and his followers, in other words, the beginnings of Christianity. Some scholars have even argued that, these were in, that they were insurrectionists, since crucifixion was reserved for political insurrection. Then, some 300 years later, we have the rule of Constantine. His moving the center of the empire out east to Constantinople inaugurates the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. The western, the western part of the empire would temporarily fall to northern invasions at this time. The third monotheistic religion is Islam, which begins with the teaching of the prophet Muhammad in Mecca and Medina in modern-day Saudi Arabia. In fact, the first year of the lunar Islamic calendar corresponds to the year 222. This is called the Hijra, or migration, which marks the moment when Muhammad and, and the first Muslims left Mecca to live in Medina after being threatened for practicing their new religion. All three religions are, are scripturally connected by the Old Testament and trace their lineage back to the family of Abraham, which is why these are all, also called the Abrahamic religions. Let's take a look at some objects associated with these three religions. Here you're seeing a Jewish synagogue from the third century. This is in Dura, Dura Europus in modern day Syria, which at the time was part of the Roman Empire. Dura Europus was religiously diverse, and there are a number of important sacred sites, including this Jewish house of worship. At the center there is the Torah niche, which is where the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, or the first five books of the Old Testament, would be read and taught to the faithful. As you can see, this space also includes murals, lots of them. Murals are paintings made directly on a wall. There are some 60 episodes depicted from the Torah and its stories associated with Moses in this synagogue. In this way, the written teachings were reinforced and visualized by artistic depictions. Here's one of the most famous murals that shows a key episode from Exodus. Moses parting the waters of the Red Sea so that the Jewish people who have escaped Egypt and are being chased by the Pharaoh's army can pass safely. Once they do, the Red Sea shuts again, drowning the, the Egyptian soldiers. There are a couple of interesting things to note in this mural. Notice how these two moments are depicted continuously and at the same time, like a cinematic before and after. On the left is Moses leading his people, or is he looking back on the Egyptian army? It's unclear. You can tell the Red Sea is parted by the poor fish flopping around in a shallow of water at the forefront. On the right, he closes the water again, and you can see the Egyptian soldiers drowning rather frenetically. So Moses appears twice in this mural, and notice how big he is. He towers over the Egyptians. There's a name for this. For this. It's called hierarchical scale. Hierarchical scale is simply the use of size to depict importance. And while Moses is incredibly important in this episode, notice that actually he's not the biggest figure in the mural. Look at that massive pair of stretched out hands coming out the top of the picture. This is an indirect representation of the Jewish God, who was forbidden to represent directly. His size and importance can only be inferred by the hands. This is a form of aniconism. One of the Ten Commandments uh, is actually the forbidding of, ma of making graven idols or false divine representations. 
This means that no three-dimensional sculptures and no representations of God uh, were allowed. So this likely explains those big hands in this composition. We now move to the Byzantine Empire. One of the key cultural centers of Byzantine art were monasteries where monks painted sacred icons. Icons are paintings on wooden panel that the faithful believe incarnates the religious figure represented. They mediate the presence of the divine. This is one of the earliest surviving icon paintings from the 6th century. It shows the Virgin Mary with the Christ child on her lap. She's enthroned in royal garb and Jesus is dressed in divine gold dress. They're flanked by two saints and above them are two angels who look somewhat fearfully at the hand of God coming through the top of the picture emanating light. Notice how stylized these figures are. They're mostly flat with ra rather large heads and eyes. In Byzantine art, there's a de-emphasizing of the human body, which is usually associated with base wants like lust. This is then emphasized. This then emphasizes the, the immaterial aspects of human existence, which for Christians is the immortal soul. These icon paintings also often address the, the viewer directly. Notice how the saints and Christ child are staring you down while Mary looks over to her left. This is important because remember, the faithful understood these objects to be truly divine. These icons would be prayed to, touched, and kissed. They were carried around during important days and rituals, and they were thought to protect whole cities. They really were thought to give the faithful access to the divine figure depicted, and actually still do. Monks in today's Eastern Orthodox Church still paint these icon paintings in a similar style. All this veneration of images leads to theological disputes. What if these images were detracting the faithful? What if people started thinking the icons themselves, the images themselves were sacred, forgetting that they served to mediate immaterial spiritual figures? In short, what if these icons were in fact false idols? This gets us back to the paradox I point out at the beginning. How can objects represent immaterial entities? Historian, historians say that this worry is one of the reasons Emperor Leo III enacted the iconoclasm that begins in 717 and lasts until 843 when the Empress Theodora reversed the iconoclasm. What did this nearly century and a half, what did this nearly century and a half of iconoclasm mean for art and works of art like these icons? It meant that many were destroyed, which means that the icon you're seeing here from before the, the iconoclasm is really rare. This moment in history is a concrete instance of images being caught up in theological and religious realities and debates. But iconoclasm didn't only happen in the Byzantine period. During the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, religious groups like the Calvinist also deemed imagery, certain imagery to be idolatry. This led to the great iconoclasm of 1566. Even music was targeted. Iconoclasts would go from town to town, destroying church organs alongside sculptures, paintings, and other forms of religious representations. It was thought that all these things were too effective, too much part of the body and its pleasures. Here we can revisit Jan van Eyck and one of the most famous Christian altarpieces. This painting also had a brush with iconoclasts and barely escaped. A mob of people set its sights on van Eyck's work, hoping to destroy it. But thankfully, the church it was planned in uh, the, the church had planned in advance, taking it apart panel by panel and placing it locked up in the bell tower for safekeeping. Amazingly enough, this was not the first time it would escape. It would have to escape iconoclastic upheavals. And what's even more incredible is that this painting would get stolen by the Nazis in World War II and was only returned by the Allies after the war. As an altarpiece, it's a devotional image commissioned for a church, in this case, St. Bado, Bado Cathedral in the Belgian town of Ghent. It's made up of multiple panels showing the Christian God in the center with Mary and St. John Baptist and St. John the Baptist at his sides. You have angels singing and playing an organ. You have Adam all the way at the top left and Eve all the way at the top right. She's holding the apple from the Garden of Eden in Genesis. And they're covering their naked bodies, which tells you that they're feeling shame and that this is after the fall, after they've committed original sin. They're also really lifelike 
especially Adam, who looks like he's just about to set, step off the ledge of his panel. At the bottom is the mystic lamb, who is being sacrificed atop a chalice. This represents the crucifixion, and all the faithful coming to see the lamb, from priests, knights, and monks, to everyday people. Here we can find prefiguration at work. Original sin and Adam and Eve are from the Old Testament, which is what Christians believe made it necessary for the arrival of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross in the New Testament. So Jan van Eyck is showing the call and response from one book to the other in this amazing painting. If in the Ghent altarpiece we find representations of God, Christ, Mary, Adam and Eve, along with other holy figures, and now turning to Islamic art, we'll find no representation of bodies whatsoever. Of the three Abrahamic religions, Islam is the most aniconic, which means Islamic art, which means Islamic art focuses far more on abstract designs and geometric shapes, intricate natural patterns, and most importantly, writing in the form of calligraphy. We see this right away in the first major landmark of Islamic art in Jerusalem. This is the Dome of the Rock. It's the third most holy site for Muslims after the Kaaba in Mecca and the Prophet's house in Medina. It was commissioned by the Caliph, or the religious leader, after Muhammad, and built on what are believed to be the ruins of the second Jewish temple of Solomon, which was destroyed in 70, uh, in, 70 in the Common Era. This area in Jerusalem is often called the Temple Mount and includes a mosque, just on the other side of the Dome on the Rock, and, a, and beautiful and lavish gardens. In Islamic art, water and the natural elements often symbolize divine paradise. The Dome of the Rock is not a mosque. It's a monument. In many ways, it represents the cultural and political success of Islam. The Golden Dome can be seen for miles, and it's true that the Islamic faith spread rapidly and grew into a great power in, a short, in, in an incredibly short period of time. There is syncretism here, too. This architecture builds off of Roman Byzantine precedents. Like the Pantheon, it's a central plan building, though in this case, it's octagonal shape. It has eight sides. The exterior of the Dome of the Rock was completely altered centuries later. So what we see today, what you're seeing in front of you, isn't from the original construction. Still, it's incredible tile work made of blue, gold, and greens. These are mosaics designs made by precious stones, tiles, or, or glass carved to fit alongside each other. We can also see that the building is teeming with calligraphy, especially along the band running at the top of its octagonal base. If we zoom in, we can see how finely crafted these textual dec decorations are. They're in the newer form of Arabic script and come from the Quran, the holy book for Muslims who recite its sutras or chapters as the direct word of God as given to the prophet Muhammad. This is why calligraphy is so important in Islamic art, and calligraphers were the most esteemed of artists. If we step inside, we also find elaborate abstract decorations in gold and more calligraphy. We also see the central focus of the Dome of the Rock, which is a small underground cave that houses the foundation stone. Muslims revere this rock because it's said this is where Muhammad went up to the heavens on the winged horse named Barak during his mystical night journey. But this site is not only holy to Muslims, it's also sacred to Jews and Christians because this is also the site where it's thought Abraham prepared to sacrifice his son Isaac from the Old Testament. This further reinforces how these three monotheistic Abrahamic religions are tied to one another. I want to show you one more object from Islamic art, which also features mosaic and calligraphy. This is a mihrab, which is an architectural niche that calls back to Muhammad's house in Medina and the specific spot from which he preached. This comes to us from a madrasa, or a theological school, in Iran, but mihrabs are considered to be the most important area in any mosque. They're also set up to face towards Mecca in order to guide Muslims in prayer. Notice the geometric and organic shapes that seem to float over the blue and aquamarine colored tiles. Notice also the calligraphy that runs along both the inner and outer frames and inside the central rectangle of the niche in the middle. The outer text is in a newer Arabic script and relates to a passage from the Quran. The inner text that runs along the white border is the oldest Arabic script we know of called Kufic script 
and it communicates the five pillars of Islam, or the central tenets of the faith. These include professing your faith, giving alms, praying, making a pilgrimage to Mecca, and fasting during Ramadan. There's also another text directly in the middle rectangular shape, and it reads, The Prophet, peace be upon him, peace be upon him the mosque is the dwelling place of the pious. So all these calligraphic elements would have reinforced the teachings of Islam, fittingly enough in a theological school, specifically the area where students would go to pray. This mosaic, however, is now in the Met Museum in New York. It was purchased in 1939. And I wonder, what do you think of this new secular context for what was once used in a religious setting? Do you think it alters the object in any way? Let's now turn to some non-Western spiritual practices. Here we have one of the earliest representations of the Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, a spiritual practice that begins in India in the 5th century before the Common Era and will spread throughout Asia and beyond. Before this period, the visual tradition of Buddhism was also an iconic. The Buddha would, would not be represented directly, only indirectly, for example, by lions, chakra wheels, and the Bodhi or Pipal tree under which he reached enlightenment. Here you're seeing Buddha in his earliest sculptural incarnation. He's seated in a lotus position, and actually on top of an actual lotus. Since lotus flowers seem to come out miraculously out of the water, they often represent divinity or purity. Below him are three lions, which might represent the spread of his teachings. The central tenet of Buddhism is that life is suffering, which we can only transcend and reach enlightenment by extinguishing our desires, desires being the source of our suffering, since we always seem to desire more. On his hands and feet, you can make out the chakra wheels, which represents samsara, the cycle of reincarnation. Smiling, he's giving you the fear not mudra with his right hand, and he has at least four symbols of holiness and enlightenment on his head. The urna, between his eyes, which is his third eye and one of the marks denoting the Buddha's perfection. The Ushnisha on top of his head, a bulb of hair that's also one of the enlightened marks of Buddha's perfection. And the halo just behind his head. Notice also the Bodhi tree, a pipal tree, growing just behind this holy disk. The Buddha was, will also often be represented with elongated earlobes. This is to recall his previous life as a prince and the jewelry that used to weigh down his ears, which he renounced to become a spiritual leader. We can also see bodhisattvas around him. A bodhisattva is someone who is ready to reach enlightenment, but decides to turn back in order to help others reach it too. All these figures and symbols that you're seeing here make up the key iconography of the Buddha. With this copper royal head, we move to the Yoruba culture in Western Africa what is present-day Nigeria. While a considerable amount of African heart has been lost due to the femoral nature of the materials used, a group of over a dozen of these bronze lifelike heads have been found. They were discovered in the, in the city of Ifa, also known as Il Ifa, which the Yoruba considered to be the sacred origin of the world. It's the site where their first ruler, their first Oni, descended from heaven to create the world. The, th the city is thought to be the belly button of the world. This sculpture does not represent a specific ruler or oni. Instead, it represents the universal, the universal notion of the divine ruler. Dwelling on universal concepts over particular instances of the universal is a key feature of, most, of much African art. These leaders are considered to be intercessors between the Yoruba people and the divine world of spirits, gods, and ancestors. This particular sculpture includes a conical-shaped headdress that may symbolize this mediation between the divine world and everyday life, which seems to resolve that paradox I bring up at the beginning of this session. Art historians also believe that these heads would have been adorned with sacred crowns used in ritual practices, which means they effectively safeguarded and protected these most sacred objects for the Ryoba people. And with our last object, we now travel to the Aztec civilization in Mesoamerica and their major city, Tenochtitlan, present-day Mexico City. With over 200,000 people, it was more populated than any city in Europe at the time. It was also one of the most 
advanced urban centers in the world. The center of Tenochtitlan was a grid-like avenue of temples, the largest being the Temple Mayor. It was the structure on top of which the Aztecs practiced human sacrifice in order to, to appease their gods. It's estimated that some 1,000 people would be sacrificed every year at the top of this temple steps by having their hearts taken out of their bodies. Here you're seeing the goddess Kotlikoi, the mother of Huitzilopochtli, the god of war, of the sun, of human sacrifice, and the patron god of Tenochtitlan. The myth goes that when Kotlikoi was pregnant with Huitzilopochtli, his siblings got jealous and tried to kill their mother. Before they could, Huitzilopochtli was born and defended his mother, killing his brothers and decapitating his sister, her body parts falling down the side of a mountain. It's thought that the large steps of the Temple Mayor was a site to recreate this origin story through human sacrifices. Blood and body parts would be sent down the temple steps, often interacting with sculptural representations of these gods. This imposing statue that you're seeing of Kotlikoi recalls these myths. Wearing a skirt made of snakes, one of her defining features, her necklace is made of human hands and her buckle is a human skull. What puzzles art historians, however, is that her head is missing. In its place are two snakes that meet each other in the middle. Their fangs and snouts seem to touch. The eyes then complete the picture, and the two snakes almost double for a single head. If this figure is decapitated, then it seems to reference Huichipochli's sister, even if the rest of the statue denot denotes his mother, Kotlikoi. Maybe the Aztec sculpture or sculptures who made this wanted to represent two mythic figures in one. It's a puzzle we may never unravel. So with these last three examples, from India, from Nigeria, and from Mexico, we're nearly led to the topic of our next session, contact. For all three of these geographies and its peoples would be colonized by European forces. And while we'll look at artworks that embody all sorts of different contact points and exchanges between cultures, many beneficial and productive, one of the most consequential and harmful events in world history is that of settler colonialism and the imperial domination of other peoples.